The following is a special presentation from 7 News. What's she stopping for? The chaos of a fire burning out of control. Come here, come here. Oh my gosh. 454, I'm in trouble. I'm stuck in my vehicle. Juma! It's okay. Panic, concern, and confusion. Is there any fire around you right now? Daddy. Oh, oh yeah, there's fire all around me. As a prescribed burn ignited by the state. Our neighbor's house is burning. Explodes into a wildfire. We're out, we're out, we're out. What were people thinking when they made that decision? Along the way, major mistakes, a burn plan with problems. How can the Forest Service follow and exceed the burn plan and violate it at the same time? Jefferson Kenny 911, where's your emergency? Communication breakdowns. Looks like you got that evacuation notice in error, so you can disregard it. And for some, this is Sam Lucas. the message to run. You know, we've got 79 mile an hour winds up here, and I got a control yeah. burn. Coming too late. Or not at all. Blowing smoke right over my house. In the end, three people would die. Look around. 22 homes destroyed. Somebody has to be responsible for this. Only seven news asking the tough questions. Who's been held accountable for the Lower North Fork fire? Looking for answers. Did they follow that burn plan? Investigating the fire. It started as an ordinary prescribed burn, only 50 acres designed to consume what could be fuel for other fires. However, that innocent burn in a matter of minutes turned deadly. And in the days and hours leading up to the Lower North Fork fire, mistakes and problems plagued everyone, from state forest employees to emergency responders. 7 News reporters Amanda Cost and Marshall Zellinger take us to where it all started. It's here, where Ann and Scott Apple lived for 22 years. Now all that's left is charred rubble. It's where Ann was on Monday, March 26, when the Lower North Fork fire roared up this mountainside. It's where she saw smoke coming from down below four days earlier when she snapped this photo. The smoke was coming from a Colorado State Forest Service prescribed burn started on Thursday, March 22nd. Four days later, it would become the Lower North Fork fire and take Ann Apple's life. When you talk about losing everything, uh, we did. Scott Apple, Ann's husband, was out of town when she sent him the photo. Ann was concerned. And we're always alarmed on that because we never know. We never have a notice. Uh, nobody up here knows what's happening. The rising smoke caught the attention of others that Thursday afternoon. Another neighbor snapped this photo. Because when you see smoke in the Lower North Fork community, you find out why. They understand that living in the mountains, we all face this risk. The views, stunning. That's Pikes Peak all the way across to Mount Evans. The neighborhood, peaceful. We built forts, we uh, played in the woods. The homes, one of a kind. I can remember the floor in my bedroom. I can remember the colors in the granite counter and the flecks of gold. Neighbors become closer than friends. We're a really tight community up here. Do anything they need. Photos show the steep terrain of the Lower North Fork area. This is where the prescribed burn took place. The State Forest Service set the burn to get rid of bark and branches from between the trees. The purpose? It was part of a long-standing program by the state agency to reduce the likelihood and impact of a devastating wildfire. The same kind of wildfire the fateful burn would start. Watch on this map as we go from the burn site only two miles to the 22 homes that would be destroyed. At 11.29 a.m. on Thursday, March 22nd, the State Forest Service filled out this go, no-go checklist, confirming the burn a go. Paperwork shows on Friday the burn being mopped up. Saturday, the burn area under patrol until 2 p.m. On Sunday, unstaffed, nothing. Even though a red flag warning was issued to take effect the following day, the prediction, hot temperatures, gusty winds the driest March on record in Colorado, especially up here. On Monday, March 26, the burn reignited, the flames fanned by gusty winds. The State Forest Service noted at 1.40 p.m. the burn slopped over. It was another 20 minutes before this radio traffic. Stand by for tones responding to lower North Fork for a slap on a control burn. At 2.12 p.m., the outlook positive. Uh, right now we have about one acre uh, that's burning plus one smaller spot. We have a low spread potential. 
At 2.21 p.m., Sam Lucas, who would die in the fire with his wife, Linda, called 911 in disbelief. That is a controlled burn. The four services out there on scene with that. Yeah, we've got 79 mile an hour winds up here, and they got a controlled yeah. burn? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Six minutes later, at 2.27, the fire grows. Sounds like we got about five acres going now. Put another tone out for North Fork. More personnel needed to respond. At 2.30 p.m., a Jefferson County Sheriff's deputy sees what's about to grab the attention of the entire metro area. The whole valley's now uh, covered with smoke, so we'll probably get more calls. Ann Apple watched as the smoke cloud grew. She called her husband. You know, as the day progressed, she said, well, this smoke is, is uh, kind of just blown up this way like it has before, so what should I do? And I said, well, as soon as we get off the phone, call 911 and figure out what's going on with it, you know. Jefferson County 911, what are you reporting? A, a fire. Where at? It's down along Foxton by the Platte River. Okay, they do have crews on the way down there. Ann called 911 at 2.34 p.m. What she and dispatchers did not know, just four minutes earlier, the fire had escaped. Okay, it's blowing smoke right over my house. <laughs> yeah, it's about five acres and growing, so they've got crews on the way. Okay, thank you. Sure. Bye. Just five minutes after Ann Apple called 911, firefighters down at the scene were already talking possible evacuations. But two hours, 18 minutes would pass before the order was made. Those up here on the ridge, unable to see the smoke, they were running out of time. Jefferson County 911, where's your emergency? Where is the fire? It's south of Critchell, off of Chester Road. Fire. It's all south of you, off of Pleasant Park Road. Oh my God, it's headed this way. Um, I don't know the direction of the fire. Dispatchers had no clue where the fire was going. This thing is off to the races. 30 to 50 miles per hour, headed for homes. Firefighters battled delays from the start, lost, looking for the fire, unsure how to get there. Uh, still unable to locate the access road. On scene, scattered communication. Right now, we're talking out here, and, and we don't have anybody that's going to kind of keep track of what's going on. Flames were only moving faster. Escape, the only option. But the call to evacuate was delayed. Or never received at all. Hello, this is 911. What are you reporting? Hey, drop, please. We have fire. Uh up here at Kester Road, North Trail Circle. Okay, yes, you guys are in an evacuation area. I need everybody to get out. But you have to come now. We have a lot of fire. Oh, no, no, we're there, ma'am. We're fighting that fire. Fire crews were still struggling to mobilize. If the resources aren't starting to get distributed, you know, we may start losing a whole lot of houses on the end of the road. 8, 6, 12, we're losing structures. Andy Hoover watched his own home burn. I'm in my driveway. The fire has burned through. My house may be burning. Yes, it is. God damn it. That's how this is burning right there. Less than an hour before he recorded this video, Doug Gulick was doing the same thing from his porch with his camera pointed to the sky. That is freaking ominous. Doug's family loaded into two cars when the ashes started raining down. Their mother, Kim, was alone and leading the way out of the drive. Doug and the children were close behind. He handed the video camera to his son right before they turned the corner. Daddy. Their escape was guided by taillights momentarily turned brake lights when Kim considered turning around. Where's mom? What's she stopping for? They had no time to stop. What sounded like a freight train was closing in. Down there. It's down there now. The sparks kept flying like tracers, red, orange, then the first hint of clear sky. Jesus Christ. It was just enough to see what was up ahead. On the right, mailboxes on the left. Right here, right here. Oh my gosh, Zuma! It's okay. We're out, we're out, we're out. A wall of fire, their freedom. Both came the moment they passed the road, leading to Ann Apple's drive. As night set, Sam and Linda Lucas were dead. Ann Apple, missing. The confusion and chaos from day one leading to anger and outrage on day two. Why a meltdown in communications? And why the confusion with the orders to evacuate? Coming up, we investigate the problems and get answers. Well, they were already calling for evacuations, and you called 911, yep. and they told you to stop calling. Exactly, yeah. They had enough indicators they shouldn't have gone forward with this. 
Telling me I'm sorry doesn't make a difference right now. As the sun rose on day two of the fire, so did the anger. Residents questioning decisions leading up to the prescribed fire, the evacuation process, and the fact that nobody was taking responsibility for what went wrong. I think it's absolutely negligent. I think it was negligent from the very start. They created a monster. They created a monster. The monster got out of hand, and they're blaming the victims for not getting out of the way. No warning, no time. I, I saw people running. I, I thought I had time. This fire could not be stopped. The questions began. They can start a fire like this uh, with no moisture predicted. Really? These are the people we trust. They're supposed to know what they're doing. The burn turned wildfire first ignited in the red zone. They set up pretty darn close to where people were. It's not like we're talking about one or two people. We're talking about an entire road that was overtaken by this. And I just think of all the places that you could have done a controlled burn at that time, wouldn't that be one of the riskiest? The wind at over 80 miles an hour literally pushes the flames horizontally. That was in the forecast. So why would you do a burn? They walked away from a fire that wasn't put out. The winds came, kicked it up, it burned my house down, killed three people, and burned down all my neighbors' houses. Wait or escape? How could that happen? And uh, nobody <laughs> warned people up this way. We continued to get the same comments from them. It's a 10-acre burn, uh, it's a controlled burn, or it's only 10 acres, or there's <laughs> crews arriving on calls. scene. I said, clearly you don't know where we are. Clearly yeah. you don't know where we are if you're telling me this. You're, you're out of your mind. And she said it was a prescribed burn. Don't worry. And look it. <laughs> it would be worse if Jim Chambers hadn't stayed behind. He never left, but not because of what he was told. He chose to. But all the ambers were flying that way, and that's what started all the little spot fires everywhere. And I mean, it was it was pretty intense. His sons snuck behind the fire line. Together, they saved at least six homes. The Apple family home destroyed. It's pretty heartbreaking when you look at him, you know. All he could do was help Scott search for Ann. When we came to look for his wife, that was, I mean, you know, he had that hope in his eye and we had to, we had to go help him search and do what we could for him. The concerns of homeowners exposing major errors. Our investigation uncovering communication meltdowns, emergency notification mistakes, and a delay in executing a timely evacuation. As the smoke built, dozens called 911 looking for direction. If there's any problem, big problems, don't you get a reverse 911 if there were well, As long as anyone's registered their phone, they'll get it. I'm just trying to figure out like what our status is. If you're going to be evacuated, they'll go door to door. We would put out like a, a notification if it's getting that bad. We just thought if something was really bad, we would get a call. The North Fork Fire Chief called for evacuations at 4.57 p.m. Jefferson County would send out the order eight minutes later. But instead of the 130 homes in immediate danger receiving the notification, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office admits it accidentally sent the alert to 20,000 numbers, some as far away as Broomfield. Realizing the mistake, the notification was stopped after 4,600 numbers. Those who got a text message saw mandatory evacuation notice, fire moving north towards Pleasant Park. That caused more people to call 911. Okay, you should not have gotten that message. No, a lot of people no. got it in error. Looks like you got that um, evacuation notice in error, so you can disregard it. The accurate reverse notification did not get sent out until 5.23 p.m. Our neighbor said our house was burned by 5 o'clock, so I don't think that would have done as much good. But A call was made to Patrick and Nancy Lansu, according to this data requested and reviewed by 7 News, but not until 6.24 p.m. Central Time. That's 5.24 here. What we found, of the 22 homes destroyed, only seven received emergency warnings, none before 5.23 p.m. Some of the homes, including Scott and Ann Apples, never received a call because the system had their home mapped in Morrison, 13 miles away. We asked Jefferson County Sheriff Ted Mink about the errors. He told us the Jefferson County Emergency Communication Authority handled the contract with First Call, the reverse notification company. We assume that they have done their due diligence with this company, no reason to doubt that, and that when we punch the button, it will work. The county blamed First Call for not mapping homes in their correct location. First Call blamed the county for providing bad data. 
what I want to emphasize is it's only a tool. It doesn't replace people's ability to react on their own should they feel threatened. That's what doesn't sit well with these victims who feel they're portrayed as helpless. We all acted in poor judgment, all of us. A question we heard over and over, why would these families leave based on the information dispatchers were providing? Small acreage, crews on scene, no evacuations. The 911 operator was still not really, you know, letting people know to get out. But we've heard from families who did leave and one who tried. I know that she was getting ready to go because we talked about that. She had all her photos, uh, all the things that were really valuable. Uh, she was getting those together and getting ready to, to head out. No one knew for sure if Ann had gotten out. It wasn't until 8 p.m. before any emergency crews would come on this property and confirm the home had burned to the ground. Ann was missing. In the days that followed, the search for Ann, X's mark, where crews searched for any sign of her. Their answer, five days later, when they learned she never made it out of what's left of her home. Errors in communication, far from the only thing to go wrong with the Lower North Fork fire. Coming up next, when the weather changed, why didn't the burn plan? And we uncover parts of the burn plan that were not even followed. There's nobody that wants to take responsibility for what happened. Now we have zero snow for this month. Maybe this burn can wait till next year. This prescribed fire plan for the Lower North Fork area, it was created long before the burn ever started. It lays out forecasting, ignition, and this plan if the fire were to escape. But Seven News uncovered the State Forest Service didn't follow its own plan. You have to be prepared for what's going to happen days ahead. Were they prepared for what happened days ahead here? I don't believe so. Rich Shell is a former chief wind, officer for the California so Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Protected. He has a history of studying fire planning, management, protection, and suppression dating back decades. Shell now works as an expert in post wildfire analysis. He gets paid to break down what went right or wrong with wildfires. But he took on the Lower North Fork fire on his own time. We asked him to review hundreds of documents, dozens of photos from the governor's review and the burn plan. This was a very high risk prescribed burn. But according to the lead expert appointed to the governor's review. It was a professionally written plan. It was professionally implemented, uh, albeit one mistake on a patrol on Sunday. The plan called for three days of patrol, which should have included Sunday, March 25th. I don't think it would have changed the outcome. No patrol, no monitoring. Possible a lot of work could have been done on Sunday. Being here Sunday would have mattered. I believe so. If you could classify that task force and that review, how would you classify it? My word is soft. Let's be, be realistic here. Nobody wants to accept responsibility or be liable for this loss, the escape prescribed burn. But there were warnings. In fact, the last burn in October of 2011 was canceled because the fire jumped the line. Five months later, on Monday, March 26, 2012, it escaped again. Only this time, they couldn't stop it. Here in March, with the drought conditions, the burning conditions were much more extreme. A red flag warning on Monday, high fire danger. That morning, the engine boss with two other men arrived on scene to pack up equipment. I find it concerning that they brought a utility pickup out as opposed to a fire engine on a day that was going to be pretty extreme conditions. What happened next? Detailed in these documents obtained by Seven News. With hand tools and a dwindling supply of water, three men spent more than one hour chasing down spot fires, reigniting faster than they could put them out. At 1.40, they called for one engine from the State Forest Service. Less than one hour later, the Lower North Fork burn declared an escaped fire. In an interview with investigators, the engine boss admitted to running out of water before help arrived. From a ridge, his crew stood and watched the fire burn. Unable to start suppression efforts, they were out of resources. Water is the firefighter's best friend. They didn't have water. They had hand tools, and the spot fire quickly got away from them 
because they didn't have all the available resources such as water on site. In your opinion, based on what you've reviewed, if someone did need to take responsibility in this situation, who would it be? Well, I, have to, I, I think it has to go back to the, the people that did the prescribed burn. However, the governor's review and the Jefferson County fire investigation name no blame. It's just as hard to be here today as it was the first day we were oh. allowed back. No one involved in the burn has been disciplined. They still have their jobs. Nancy Lansu has no home. This we is an act we, of humans. We didn't start the fire. No. Mother Nature didn't start the fire. No. The Colorado Forest Service started the fire, period. Errors in communication, a burn plan not followed. So is anyone to blame for the Lower North Fork fire? And why is the fire not considered a crime? Up next, be, we take those questions to the governor. Who's been held accountable for the Lower North Fork fire? Look around and somebody has to be responsible for this. Who's to blame for the Lower North Fork fire? Now, this is just a portion of the documents that Seven News has asked for. We have reports and reviews, burn plans, all of the dispatch audio. So far, the state and county investigations point the finger at no one. This is either right or it's wrong. That's what I want to hear an answer to. What were people thinking when they made that decision? Look around and somebody has to be responsible for this. There's nobody that wants to take responsibility for what happened. We've heard from the fire victims, our expert, yes. even the sheriff. Now 7 News going straight to the governor for answers. Who's been held accountable for the Lower North Fork fire? Well, at this point, we're still working through the, the sequence and the facts. Governor John Hickenlooper called for an independent review of the fire. It revealed some missteps, including not monitoring the burn for a required three days. Someone started the fire. Three people died, two dozen homes damaged or destroyed. No one was found to be criminally liable. No one's been fired. There's been no discipline. What kind of message does that send? Well, it's a message that is very frustrating for people, and I understand that. It's, justice is slow. If mistakes were made, and, and you know, I'm not arguing that there weren't mistakes in this whole process, how, what's the appropriate uh, discipline as a result of those, those mistakes. Those people should be canned. Oh, oops, sorry, doesn't really cut it. I asked the state's CEO if he plans to discipline anyone from the State Forest Service. Let me be clear, they don't report to me, right? They report to Colorado State University. So I don't have authority to, to discipline anybody, but that's certainly concerning. Can you make recommendations? Um, we, we certainly can make recommendations. Do you plan on it? Well, again, our goal is to bring get all the information, right, and not rush to judgment and, and to make uh, certain that we have heard and, and seen all, all sides of the issue. That being said, I, s I suspect we will have some recommendations once, once we get all the information. With all this damage, the governor and the state legislature now dealing with what's fair compensation. And this can't be fixed by insurance, and people don't seem to understand the difference there. You can't insure land. You can't insure the beauty of the property. Scott Apple lost his wife, his memories, and his home. He's left with charred acres, just like his neighbors. The state's liability, $600,000, divided among all victims. If people think we should revisit that and raise the cap, I I'm happy to lead that discussion. For most families up here who lost everything, the lack of accountability is most upsetting. Well, they believe if change is to come, it starts with someone taking responsibility. After we started asking questions, now the state is taking action. They've spent weeks opening up to us about their loss. Now they're at the mercy of state lawmakers. It's just devastating. We lost everything that we've ever worked for. I can remember the love that went into all the things in that home. But insurance can't replace dreams, memories, lives. It can't do that. I keep hoping that, you know, it's like a bad dream. I need to be able to trust that our elected officials will actually do the right thing. One by one, the plea to convince elected representatives to support a bill that could possibly pay for this, and this, and this. 
In the last seven years, out of 175 prescribed burns in Colorado, only two had ever escaped. The destruction this one caused is new territory for the state. Two investigations so far have danced around any blame. A third investigation by the U.S. Forest Service could take more than a year. The whitewashes that we've seen so far don't cut it. The way Colorado's law is written today, Lower North Fork fire victims will have to sue the state to try to collect any of just a portion of $600,000. I had beauty and now it's coals. This was a life, a dream, and uh, it's gone. Lawmakers are trying to fast track a bill to allow victims to bypass the courts and file claims with the legislature without a dollar limit. The attorney general's office questions if it violates the state's constitution. To think that the state could get away with killing people and burning down our homes and not be penalized is horrifying. It'll be months before we know how much the state will pay for 4,140 acres, 22 homes. But we know today that no one can put a price on the lives lost. Sam Lucas. Linda Lucas, Ann Apple. On March 26, 2012, I think Colorado lost one of its greatest women. Rest in peace, Ann Apple, rest in peace. The Lower North Fork Fire was a tragedy, a tragedy that killed three people and destroyed 22 homes. No one caused it on purpose. There is no one person to be blamed. However, our continued investigation is revealing mistakes, some made months before the burn ever started. As the state continues to investigate what went wrong, so will we. We want to thank the North Fork community for all its help and all the firefighters who worked so hard to battle that fire. Thanks for watching.